Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host today. Boy, I tell you, we've got a show today. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to do two phases of this thing. We're talking about the the so-called National Affordable Care Act. National Affordable Care Act. Normally referred to as the Obama Act, so to speak. Affordable, well, Obama insurance or whatever, right? Something Obama to that effect. I'm just, and then Tom, the doctor we have here on, on basis, he says the Obamacare, and he, he's mentioning that because he's looking for business, and we do not promote private business on this show. He knows that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> we, but folks, in all, in all seriousness, uh, we've got quite a show today. We, uh, we have someone here with us today that will probably maybe define uh, this whole business that's happening right now, as you know, in Washington, D.C., the Affordable Care Act, a lot of times known as Obamacare Act and something of that effect. But uh, what we're going to do, we're going to focus a bit on Oregon. And uh, it's like making our, our branding may be Oregon Affordable Care Act. How about that? Oregon Affordable Care Act. We're going to stay out of the politics of uh, the Obama Affordable Care Act situation. That's a little bit more of a polit- political standpoint. But we have someone here with us today that's going to kind of take us through this maze and and get us to the point where we can sort of understand what we're dealing with from a national perspective. Because at no, as you know, right now, for those of you who are on Medicare and, and the like, uh, are being bombarded today in the mailbox and on the videos, on the tubes and this, that, and the other, about now picking out your plan, your respective plan. And even to this date, you might have been on the plan for maybe four or five years. You still don't understand. It depends upon who knocks on your door and, and forces you to sign here on the dotted line. But uh, so anyway, we're going to try to make some sense of that. And I think we, we've gotten, again, as usual, you choose is, uh, has been someone that we have been, as you know, we've been working with very closely. Uh, they've been very instrumental, if you will, in getting, getting us uh, speakers that can talk in, on various subject matters. And, and we are just delighted at the fact that uh, we have joined ventures with them. And we really appreciate the, their input in helping us out and getting to you, the, the viewing audience, uh, uh, quote, uh, a definition as it relates to information and educa- educating you about issues that are relevant to your way of life. And so with that, today we, we've, got a, we've got, they've sent us a person by the name of Lisa Lettenmeyer. She is an insurance broker type of a person, Health Sources Northwest, that's her business aspect of it. And if you'll notice on the, uh, on the tube, uh, said, there's a website there and a phone number that you can call her. I will make note of that, and periodically they'll just flash that on the screen. But what we're going to do, we're going to be basically sending, giving her some questions and having her see if we, she, she can take us through the maze and give you a better feel of what's happening. But I want you to focus on Oregon health care, Oregon affordable health care. And then uh, let's keep the politics out of it as much as we possibly can. But, we'll, but at the same time, we're going to get a good definition from her of what the national plan is all about also, too. So why don't we start off first with... Um, uh, let's talk about, in fact, and, and better yet, why don't we talk about Oregon affordable health care first? <laughs> you, what we have, what we had on the table before the national piece came to the table. Okay. That, does that make sense? Absolutely. Let's See talk what about what we have now. What do we have so now? So we know what we're transitioning to. What we're transitioning to and its impact on that piece. Okay. Is that fair? That's absolutely fair. Lisa, first, before we go into that, let's talk a little bit about Lisa. Are you All from right. the Are you from the Pacific Northwest or Oregon? I'm actually from California. California, which well, I don't tell very many people. Up well, here you're in a neighboring because, state, you know okay. what I mean. We, we're about ready to <laughs> annex you all anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you all need help. No? <laughs> <laughs> so I've been here since 1997. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great move for me. Met my husband. I have a beautiful daughter, and we live on the family farm. And we just got into horses a couple years ago, so we're pretty busy. Oh, great. So how long have you been in this business? How do you get in this? Uh, this is actually 10 years now um, 10 years. that I've been doing insurance. I actually, prior to that, spent about 13 plus years in corporate accounting. And I just got tired, tired of the corporate environment, tired of the hitting the glass ceiling. And so on a whim, I left and got my insurance license and eventually uh, started with the insurance agency that I have here, Health Source Northwest. And I love it. I love what I do. I get to help people every day. Oh, good. I, I like the idea you said accounting, so you can add. One and yes. one is two for you, right? Yeah, my whole entire family is really artistic. My mom, my dad, my sister, 
Me, not so much. Okay. But if you give me a bunch of numbers, I'm a whiz. I like you all the yeah. way. Yeah, so, so I'm a hit at a party. You understand the bottom line. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, that's fantastic. So what, so what do we have here in Oregon as far as health plans concerned? So what right now, so right. what we're going to talk right about as it's transitioning. Right now, if you were to, as an individual, right. trying to go buy an insurance plan, what would happen is you would, uh, there's about eight different carriers in the state. You'll pick a plan that you want to apply for. So you do apply, and you're going to go through a series of questions. Currently, there's about 55 health questions. All the carriers have to ask you the exact same questions. They can't deviate. They are allowed to go back five years on your health history. They could pull medical records if they chose. Now, here in Oregon, because of our insurance regulations, their only options are to either accept you for the plan that you asked for, to come back and say, we'd like to have you as a client, but we'd like you to go to a higher deductible. It's called a downgrade offer. Or they come back and say, we're sorry, we can't take you on. We're going to decline you because of your health history. So if you're declined right now in our individual market, we have a safety net. We call it Oregon Medical Insurance Pool. OMEP is what we call it for short. That is a state-based health insurance plan for those people that have a declinable condition or who have been declined. And so it's a high-risk pool. It's actually managed currently by Regents Blue Cross. And so everybody in this state, I always tell people this, it's fascinating, they think that they can't get health insurance. I assure people right now, you, everybody, every Oregonian can get it. Every Oregonian. Absolutely, because you either get it through your employer, you go out and buy an individual plan if you can qualify, or if you can't qualify, you go through OMEP, the high-risk pool. Mm -hmm. It is a, a question of cost, right? So what's the premium cost, and can you afford it? So in our state, which is unique, Everybody can get insurance. It's just a matter of the cost. So only about 35 states in the nation had a high-risk pool that worked like ours. Ours was one of the better-ran ones. Um, and so those will realistically be going away as we head into a, to Affordable Care Act. What qualifies a person to get in that particular plan? Again, if and you had a declinable, yeah, any, any age. Any age. But it currently, if you've gone through underwriting with an individual uh, insurance carrier, and they've come back and said, we're not going to take you because of health history, mm -hmm. then that right there is your guarantee into the Oregon Medical Insurance Pool. No matter what your age, it is age-banded. So the older you are, the more you're going to pay. It is going to typically be about 20 to 30% higher than a standard plan on the market because it's intended for the high-risk population. You know, one, one wonders with that statement, one wonders sometimes you hear this thing about the fact that uh, uh, under policy, anybody can walk in a hospital Absolutely. With no plan and says, hey, I'm sick or this, that, and the other, and you've got to get taken care of. Absolutely. What You're happens? still responsible for the bills, though. Yeah, but, but if they never pay the bill. Well, financially for them, okay. they're going to have some issues with their credit score, okay. right? Because okay. it is a liable bill that you right. need to pay. Okay. But the reality is our hospitals, all hospitals, have a certain amount of bad debt. They know people walking into the ER, probably 30 40%, the numbers I've heard, are not going to get paid. Those bills will just not get paid. 30 40%. Absolutely. Now, that's not of the whole. That's not 30 40% of the population. No, it's of the ER, ER bills just of when the you ER. look at the numbers. So that's one of the reasons that going to the ER is so expensive. If you look mm -hmm. at an ER bill versus if you'd gone to your doctor for that same ankle sprain, okay. the reason is the ER has to inflate their prices. So the ones that can't afford to pay it or have insurance to help pay for it are basically subsidizing for the bills that aren't getting paid. Hmm. Hmm. So, and that's what happens a lot with our healthcare system right now. Wow. So that's us yeah. at this point in time. What about numbers in terms of uh, if you were to say you talk to numbers in terms of what it would cost the average person for insurance? Again, it's going to depend. Yeah, it's it's going to depend on the plan that you picked. So, did you want a low deductible plan, high deductible plan? What's your age? How many people are on the plan? But uh, I was looking this up just for our show. If you were a 40-year-old a buying a high-deductible tax-qualified plan, so those I sell, I sell a lot. They're just a, a way to cap your out-of-pocket exposure, give you some tax benefits. As a 40-year-old, that would right now cost you about $168 a month. And you know, with the Affordable Care Act as it sits right now, the changes that have already happened, that gives you 100% coverage on your preventative. And then you do have a high-deductible and a co-insurance to meet for other services, but the max out of pocket right now would be five thousand dollars out of your pocket. So if you had a major medical event, the carrier is taking the brunt of all of that. You're just paying the first five thousand. Mm -hmm. Much more manageable than obviously if you had to walk in and pay the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. We get, we're going to get into the national affordable care Act aspects of it, but some of the little things that were mentioned during this, well, do the arguments, do the politics, and whatever things like pre-existing and some mm -hmm. of the things that they were talking to, whatever. What, what about the availability here in Oregon? So Insurance right companies. now, right, right or now. okay, right now. again, right now you're going to go through medical underwriting. So okay. it depends. Um, it could be you know somebody who's diabetic. Any diabetic is not insurable right now okay. with our current system. Okay. If you've had cancer in the last five years, if you've had any major coronary issues, if you have a com 
combination of some smaller issues. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're slightly overweight and you've got blood pressure and cholesterol issues. You're probably not going to get picked up right now. Okay. So as we head into the Affordable Care Act and its fruition truly in 2014, um, that will go away. There will not be any medical underwriting of any kind and no pre-existing exclusions. Mm -hmm. So that you absolutely could look at and say that's a positive for people who may not have been able to qualify for plans. Now again, some states who didn't have a safety net like we do, that was a huge issue. In our state, you could qualify for a plan. It's just a matter of could you afford the premium. So, how how do you think we would we would list we'd list as far as the other states in the union as far as health care? Well, I mean, I'm just as far completely as guessing. I mean, on that. right. So I'm not a I'm not an expert on the top entire 10%, fifty percent. I think so, only because, again, our regulations are very consumer friendly. They're driven to protect the consumer. We don't, uh, here in Oregon, the carriers are not allowed to rate you specific to your health or to drop you from coverage if your claims are too high. So in other states, that can happen. It's not ever, you know, it's not been able to happen here in Oregon. I think in our past, that was an issue, but they changed the regulations. So very consumer protective here. Other things that we might have here that even our neighboring state like Washington doesn't have is mandated maternity. So we have that right now. Every single health plan sold, both individual and group in Oregon, has to have maternity coverage. Right across the border into Washington, that's not a mandate. So I bring that up because as we head into Affordable Care Act, there is a list of medical services that have to be covered under all uh, individual and small group plans. Mm -hmm. And one of those mandates is maternity care. So we already had it here in Oregon, won't really impact our policies here, but over across the river, Washington, that hasn't been a mandate, so now it will be. Another mandate that is going to affect our policies here in the individual market is mental health. And that's always a huge issue with everybody. We, we want people that need those services to have access. Currently in our state, if you're buying a small group or large group health plan, mental health coverage is mandated. It has to be covered like any other health benefit. But in the individual market, currently right now, in our current market, mental health is not mandated. So most carriers either don't cover it or only cover a portion of it. As we head into Affordable Care Act, again with that list that we now, you know, all the carriers have to cover, the essential health benefits list, that will be a mandated service. So for somebody who's had a health policy that did not cover mental health for them up to this date, that's gonna be an improvement for them as they go into 2014. So we are gonna see some wins, but we're also gonna see some struggles just in understanding the system and the cost. Um, some people will have a, a higher cost. Our nation will probably have a higher price tag. You know, maybe we just went a little ahead of the game, but we were talking about Oregon to begin with. But let's go back just a moment. And, you know, you, you've been in this business for quite some time, but when this thing was first put on the table, uh, what was your reaction about the, the Federal Affordable Care Act or the Obamacare? Obama well, Care? actually, I'd already been somewhat active in it because as an insurance agent here in Oregon, um, our legislators were already pushing towards this idea of an exchange to okay. transform Oregon's health care system. So I had already been somewhat involved in trying to understand what they were looking at and how that would impact the consumer. And, and for my uh, situation, we were just trying to make sure that the agent was there to assist the client. So I've okay. kind of understood that this has been coming. On the national level, I can tell you that the only time in my life that I have ever watched a Senate vote go down mm -hmm. as a national was the day uh, you know that we passed uh, the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. So I watched that vote go down. In addition, the first time I've ever listened to a Supreme Court hearing uh, or testif testifying yeah. was you know, when they were debating the um, the Affordable Care did Act. Did it make sense to you? It did because obviously I this is what I do. What you do, right, right, right. Yeah, so so you know I get asked a lot of questions about that, but but absolutely it's it's been interesting to watch it, and again if we're looking at our nation currently, we have issues. We have people that can't afford to get health insurance, mm -hmm. and we have very high cost health care. So the two get kind of muddled together because the reality is this law was mostly a health insurance reform, not so much a health care reform. Mm. Health care reform would have been how do we systematically very precisely go in and figure out how to how to really manage those costs? Mm -hmm. Why are they high? What are the driving factors and what can we do to pull that back and start to bend that curve? Most of the law was around um, the, the, the regulation of insurance, insurance carriers, taxing, um, uh, mandating that people buy insurance, 
um, mandating uh, that employers provide insurance. So that's where the focus was. So when people hear of you know health care reform, I really think of it as health insurance reform. I would have actually preferred a law that was more focused on the health care reform piece. Health care reform, okay. Yeah. okay. And when people ask me, you know, what would you have done? I mean, there's a whole list of things that you could mm -hmm. try to do. Mm -hmm. Of course, until you try them, does it work? we got to move a little fast on that. But, for example, when um, I'm talking with any client, one of my pet peeves as a consumer, as an insurance agent, as a taxpayer, uh, is the idea that we have drug commercials on TV. And the reason for that is, as a consumer, you're sitting there at home and you're watching the TV. And when that drug commercial comes on, those symptoms that they list off are pretty common symptoms. I mean, if you're just living and getting up every day and trying to work and pay your bills, you're probably tired, stressed. You might be losing your hair. I mean, let's be mm -hmm, honest, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So as you go through and hear this list, you're like, well, maybe that's me. I'm going to go to my doctor and tell him I think I need this medication. So we've got a couple things going on there. We are now thinking that we're the doctors. We go to our doctor and we tell him what we think he needs to do with us what, to prescribe. Mm -hmm. And then he's now got faced with an issue. He's got liability insurance. So he's either going to have to proactive, you know, give you what you want because he's got a limited time with yeah. you, or he's going to have to worry about defensive medicine. He's going to have to run some tests that may or may not be necessary. Um, and on top of that, when you watch those drug commercials, I love the invention of the DVR so you can, you know, pause mm -hmm. and back up and mm -hmm. re. When you listen to those lists of side effects, I don't know if that you're going to be better off taking that medication. Sometimes kind of like a small print. Yeah. But the reality is it's just a symptom of the problem. As, mm -hmm. as an American mm -hmm. nation, we don't really handle ourselves on a proactive level. How can we you know, live healthy and be healthy? We think in the after the fact. We're very reactionary. And I actually um, looked into this just because I was curious. There's only two countries in the world that actually allow drug commercials on TV, us and New Zealand. Really? Yeah. Wow. So kind of fascinating, isn't wow. it? Yeah. Wow. You know, you hear a lot of times about the fact that uh, uh, most doctors are basically just prescribed. You come in. Mm -hmm. Hey, my name is Joe Blow. Hey, take this pill. Right. But think about well, our what's society. The deal? Why are, are we going to that way? But think about who, who are we are as a nation. I mean, we have drive through Starbucks. Not to say that I don't use that mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. But right. the reality is we're a nation who is very fast-paced. We don't take vacations the way that other countries do. We Our work week is much more expanded than most countries. We're, we're just more driven. We're more fast-paced. And we also want quick fix. So you can go to any aisle in the grocery store and find all kinds of quick fix remedies right. anywhere, right? So when you go into the doctor's office and you're having some type of a symptom or an ailment, is there, does, does the doctor, first of all, have the time to spend with you to really walk through and figure out what's going on in your life? Mm -hmm. What kind of stresses? What are you eating? How are you sleeping? What's your environment like? That would be how you'd get to the root of the problem. They don't have that kind of time. Most of our primary care doctors mm -hmm. spend honestly 10, 15, 20 minutes with you because that's all they have. They've got to move on to that next person because they're seeing a huge list of people that day. So when you're there, you as a consumer want an answer. We expect an answer. That doctor's only got so much time with you, so he's going to respond based upon what you're telling him in symptoms. And the reality is a quick fix is to give you a medication. Well, now, not all doctors work that way, but that yeah, can happen. But, but my point is when you walk in, you know, you, I mean, he's the doctor. Absolutely. He or she's the doctor. I'm not the doctor. Right. And if, they can, if they're saying within 15 minutes they're going to be able to prescribe my solution to my, my issue, Sounds a little I mean, counterintuitive, that's doesn't right. it? That's right. As far as I'm concerned, they're still liable, right? Right. Are they not? Well, and that's Depends. why we have that's why we have defensive medicine. Have you heard that terminology before? No, I haven't. What is that? So, defensive medicine is when a doctor, because their liability insurance have gone have escalated. So, for a doctor to practice his you know his medical practice, he has to have liability insurance. Right. Well, with our litigious society, and we all have to agree, we have a pretty litigious society. Our doctors, if you're coming in and saying, I think I've got this, that, first of all, how we all communicate with that doctor is different. How I might communicate my symptoms might be different than the next person, okay? But he's got a very short amount of time to hear what you're saying and make an assumption or, 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 or get, a, get a fix going. So if he doesn't make sure that he's checked everything out, hmm. right? Let's say he missed something because he only had 15 minutes with you, you're going to come back potentially and sue him if something didn't go perfect you have the ability to come back and sue him. So our doctors um, have struggled with that. We call it defensive medicine. So they might order additional tests that are not necessary or a secondary test. You know, they might repeat a test because they're trying to protect themselves. The reality is both here in Oregon and at a national level, when you look at all of these insurance regulations or the changes, really the Health Care Reform Act, um, there was not one ounce of tort reform. Hmm. Tort reform would have actually helped 
in that idea, because two things would have happened. First of all, Share we, with us the, what is tort reform? Tort reform yeah. would be putting limits on what you can sue a doctor for liability. Okay. Okay. And I tell everybody, if anybody, whether it's a doctor or anybody is, is, is a professional, is doing something and they're and they have gross misconduct, right? They just completely, they come in and they operate on the wrong knee, right? Mm -hmm. So then mm -hmm. now they have to mark mm -hmm. that. That obviously is something that needs to be dealt with. I think personally, you, you, you know, that's a licensing issue too. Um, but when we expect our doctors to be perfect, when we think that medical science is perfect, that, that there's a quick fix or a quick answer for everything, we're fooling ourselves. It's not how medical science works. So as a doctor, having tort reform at least puts some limits so that we're not awarding people outrageous amounts of money for you know pain and suffering and mistakes, which the re again, reality is medical science isn't perfect. And not only that, you go to the doctor, you told him something, did you tell him everything? Did you communicate it the right way? Did you go home and do exactly what he told you to do? No. Right? So you can see yep, where there's this right. gray area. Tort reform is just putting limits on that so that doctors aren't being held liable to, to mm -hmm. these astronomical lawsuits. Mm -hmm. um, that would be one way to start to curve the cost because not only could it help bring down the cost of their insurance, but also maybe it can curve, again, that idea of defensive medicine. Doctors doing things not really because they thought that they should, but because they needed to to check a box. Mm -hmm. and well, Lisa, well, tell me, uh, when the Affordable Care Act came on, came to the table, you know, I'm talking about in the Washington aspect of it, you looked at it. Mm -hmm. uh, with your background and whatever you tried to, <laughs> right? Okay, good. I like that. We, we, that's exactly where I'm it going. It was moving pretty fast. That is right. <laughs> and, and, that's exactly, and I, and I, I know I didn't understand what was going on at the beginning right off the right. bat. The majority of us didn't. You know what I'm saying? Right. So at the end of the day, when the Supreme Court, I, I'm using that one as a, as a way, okay. Supreme Court said, okay, fine, it's okay, gave it the green light, whatever, it became law and whatever. What did you think? Were there pros and cons there? And there? What were the pluses about it and what were the negatives? Well, the pluses is that within the law, Anybody could argue that now, if somebody had been struggling to get health insurance, they couldn't qualify before, and now they can, that's a plus for that person. Okay. Absolutely, it's a plus for that person. They may have not been able to get the insurance to then get the care that they needed. Okay, so we, everybody can agree that's a plus. There's a cost that comes with that, though. If an insurance carrier has to cover everybody, regardless of their health history, there's no, they have no uh, ability to do a risk assessment. That's how insurance works, right? Right, exactly. You, and your auto insurance is the same thing. They ask, what kind of a car do you drive? How far do you drive? You know, cool. what's your driving record? So there's an assessment there to decide how much you should pay because of that. So that goes away. Nationwide, whether you're buying individual or group, there is no longer any medical underwriting. So there's no pre-existing uh, exclusions or anything like that. So that's a plus for those people that were, that were held out. Mm -hmm. But there's a cost. So ine inevitably, your insurance carrier is going to have to drive prices up because they have an unknown risk coming their way. So um, that part of it I agree with. The thing that was really troubling is the, the idea of the mandate, so that, that we're going to require everybody to buy insurance. Now, you can absolutely argue, especially as a numbers person, I would make this argument, that to make a national system work, that you're trying to get coverage for everybody, how do you do that? Well, you have to, you have to make them buy right. it. Right. But the thing is, what are the teeth to make them buy it? If the teeth aren't sharp enough, are they really going to go out and get the insurance? And the teeth that are in the mandate really aren't sharp enough. So it's not, I, I don't know that it's going to have the driving force that it needs to. And you can argue all day long. I, I think I've heard a lot of people say, this is the first time in our history that our government is telling us we must buy mm -hmm. a private product. It's a product. Especially healthy folks. Right. Okay. So you, you could argue that, you know, what, what's the leg legitimacy? Now, when the Supreme Court came back, they said, well... The law called it a penalty, but we're not going to call it that because Congress doesn't really have a right to push a penalty out for not buying a product. Congress does have a right to tax you. So that's why the Supreme Court actually renamed it a tax. Hmm. So it's a tax if you don't. So if you're hit at the end of the year with that cost, that mandated, you know, that penalty, we're actually going to refer to it as a tax. IRS is going to collect it, and that's where it's mm -hmm. going to come from. Um, one of the other issues about the law that I have that a, a huge problem with is the employer mandate. An employer mandate saying every company out there with 50 full-time equivalent employees must now provide insurance for every employee working 30 hours or more a week. Now I look, you know, again, I came from corporate America and the, the reality is when I was working with corporate America, I had my payroll, I had my bonus, and I also had my benefits. And I certainly probably wouldn't have taken a job without that. 
but I was working in a career and I had a choice of where I wanted to work. They had a choice of who to hire. I had a choice of who to work for. Mm -hmm. I don't equate uh, working in that environment necessarily to having a part-time job at Regal Theatres or Target because typically part-time it's very in flux. Mm -hmm. People are coming and going, hours are up and down, and it might be because it's a second job or maybe you're a high school student or a college grad or whatever the case may be. These are not meant to be, you know, full-time, that's not how you're going to support your entire family. So when you say to an employer, like a retail or service industry, you now must offer insurance and pay at, you know, at least a certain amount of it, 50%, let's say, or make it affordable for everybody working 30 hours or more. Mm-hmm. So if an employer like Target or Regal Theaters or anybody like that, again, service retail, was employing people part-time and they're averaging hours of 32, 34, 36 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Now that employer has to look at their profit margin and figure out how much is it going to cost me to cover insurance. And the reality is, and you've seen article after article, I know I have, that there are major employers across the nation that are saying, okay, fine, we don't have it. It's not in our budget or our profit margin to offer that. So what we're going to do, we're going to scale the hours down to 29 hours a week Hmm. because that's right below the threshold. So everybody's going to argue, well, that's not fair for the employer to do. And I'm going to say back to them, I understand how that feels, that an employer is going to scale back hours to that person so that they don't have to offer health insurance. But here's the flip side. If that company didn't have that money in their budget, in their profit margin, whatever you want to argue about, they were going to have to push that money in there, which meant that they were going to have to raise their prices. That affects everybody. So that's the trade-off. If a company's going to give that insurance away, that's a cost. It's a cost increase to a business. They have to push that cost out someplace. So cost of goods, cost of services is going to go up. Or the flip side is they avoid it and they only offer it to people that are truly working, you know, they're more full-time staff, uh, employees, and now you've got people getting less hours. Hmm. What about those em- employees of 50 or, or less? They are not what, what currently mandated to offer insurance, so, so they're what fine. Do they do? What, 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 are, what are just continue doing what they're doing? They can continue doing what they're doing. If you're, if you're a really small employer, uh, under 25 employees, really targeting down to the 10-man group, uh, 10 man group the, the, the government did with the Affor- Affordable Care Act when it first passed back in March of 2010, they immediately said, hey, we're going to really try to help out those really small employers to offer insurance coverage to their employees mm-hmm. by giving them a tax credit. So if you're a really small employer with average payrolls of 50000 or less, then there is potentially tax credits for you to help buy you know, your, your employee's insurance. So mm-hmm. there's, there's some incentives. Those are scheduled to go away in 2016, but they've been there since 2010. Because mm-hmm. when, when you think about the small employers aspect, they're always trying to look for incentives, if you will. Absolutely. For employees and you know, insurance people are always looking to work for. That's why a lot of folks are just going to government, you know, because they can pick up those uh, purrs and... Yeah. And got the goodies, right? Absolutely. <laughs> you know yeah. Now, uh, the other thing about the, uh, again, Affordable Care Act aspect of it. So where do we stand now? Let's, let's get right up in that bit. Where, where do you think we stand now in terms of that piece? Where, where should we go? Right what now. What should we do? Yes, right now. What, what do we do? Well, to be honest with you, we can't, the idea of repealing the entire law is not feasible at this point because we are four years into it. Our insurance carriers, to some extent the employer's, Everybody's been modifying their regulations, the insurance division state by state, the carriers that work in those states. Everybody's been modifying everything to fit this law. There's already been changes that have happened. So everybody's been focused on 2014, but we've already seen a lot of changes happening to the industry. So to unravel it or just cut it off right now wouldn't be feasible. Mm -hmm. However, you could take a look at it and say, what's working and what's not? Where are areas that we really overshot? that the cost to the nation is going to be too high. Um, how, how, do, how do we make this thing work now? Mm-hmm. So I, I think that we could certainly change pieces of it and, and dial it back. Okay. Um, and I, my, you know, my biggest thing is what's it going to cost the nation? Because every time what, the feds spend a dollar, it's our dollar. Yeah, because we're going into budget stuff very shortly, whatever. Yeah. Why don't we do a short break and then we'll come back and we'll start right there. Okay. Okay, good. We'll be right back with Lisa, okay? You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Welcome back, folks. Again, the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. And we're talking to a subject matter that I tell you, I think about 90% of us here in Oregon and throughout the country are really having problems trying to figure out what is going on with this whole issue about health care. I mean, at one point in time, we, we were already, we, in fact, we're still going through the situation trying to figure out if you're a senior or better trying to figure out all these different plans that are being that you're being subjected to mm -hmm. trying to figure out what do I do now where do I go now where do I go now uh, I'm constantly being visited here I mean I just want to be taken care of I paid for the system and what's the problem <laughs> okay so anyway, we're just trying to get some answers and we've got someone here with us today that I think is opening up many doors for us and I think I'm really excited about it I'm talking about Lisa Lentenmeyer she's uh, she's Health Resources Northwest and she's an insurance broker or if not that a spokesperson, if you will, that comes down and sit down with you and try to take you through this maze and get you what you might need. There's a website on the, on the uh, should be on the tube there now, and a phone number that you can give her a call beyond this, because as you know, this is about information and education. And especially now with the baby boomers, trust me, I want you to take your vacation. It's a long due, <laughs> long due, you, you really need the vacation. You've been working your head off for days and others, things thing like that. But the bottom line is that uh, you need to enjoy that, that time. But in all due respect, uh, this health care issue is something that's sort of holding us, a number of us back. And so it's very important that we understand as much as we can. Because <clears throat> now we're going into this new venture, if you will, of the federal, if you will, federal Affordable Care Act. And But we've been spending a little bit more time of Oregon Affordable Care Act because I think <laughs> that's where you need to focus it right now. And then call somebody like Lisa, and then she might be, what she will be doing basically is integrating, if you will, whatever she can integrate, from the from the National Affordable Care Act aspect of it into your Oregon plan, and I think that's a, that's basically what we're discussing right now. Hopefully, you understand it. What we're going to do? We're going to open up the line here with the next 15 minutes, and you can give us a call. In fact, uh, uh, I think it would be a bad idea anyway. If you got some ideas right now, give us a call. But now remember, now make your questions short and to the point, so Lisa can respond to it. Because I'm sure there are others out there that may not call, but I would like for you to call. And by the way. Have these discussions, and you can look at the shows um, uh, in the coming weeks, and as you know, you can do the YouTube aspect of it, and you can just review it and then have discussions among yourselves, if you will. Bring your kids around at the table and whatever, because at the end of the day, they've got to pretty well make the decisions anyway for you, if you know what I mean, okay? So, Lisa, this has been great. Thank you. Good. Now, let's see. We were we were just getting into, the again, the federal stuff, still still trying to integrate this stuff in our Oregon Mm -hmm. Affordable health care plan, right? That's yeah. right so let's talk about that. Well, and you, you know, as you as you opened up <clears throat> this segment, you talked about the people that are out there facing Medicare changes or right. trying to make decisions. Right. I do want to be really clear: when we're talking about the Affordable Care Act, that is changing how our individual health plans work and small group health plans work. There's not a lot that the Affordable Care Act directly impacted on Medicare. So when you've got people out there that are absolutely getting a ton of stuff in their mailbox, they might be getting phone calls. Medicare program, for all purpose sakes, is staying the same. So reviewing your plan, making the right decision for the next year based upon your care, your medications, those are things you should be doing. Don't wait for or think that that has anything to do with Cover Oregon or our exchange. That oh. is specifically health insurance That's for individuals and small groups. Say that one more time for the group. Okay, okay. so <clears throat> if you're Medicare age, Medicare you're, you're going to be focusing on what you've already been on and making those choices. That is not a part of directly the Affordable Care Act. Okay. Okay. So Medicare as it's as a program. And that's 65 or older retirees. 65 or, or older, or if you're disabled under 65 okay. and you're on Medicare. Okay. So, but you do need to review your plan right now, and you need to make decisions about what's, what your coverage needs to be, your medications, because as of October 15th through December 7th, that is your time frame as a Medicare beneficiary to look at your plan and make decisions that and will I take impact it, there are changes now. There are changes. Uh, well, there's change, every year there's changes to the and plans. See, and see, I get older. I mean, I, I, I can't deal with changes. <laughs> so find somebody that you trust. I That's tell right. everybody right. it isn't a matter of uh, it, it, you need to find somebody that you like because you can buy these plans anywhere. You can go to the carrier. You can go to Medicare.gov. You can go to an agent. You can go to your friend. Find somebody you trust who's going to help you understand it because it doesn't cost any different no matter where you go and buy it. It's just who do you trust to help you understand it? Who's going to make that make sense for you and do the right research? Researching but, your medications and things like that. But, you know, benefits vary, though, from plan Absolutely. to plan. Absolutely. I mean, that, which that, is that, why that's, you, that's the thing that bugs which you. Which is why unless you're an expert at it, definitely asking questions. Carriers will hold their own classes. You can find agents. You can find volunteers. But finding somebody to help you understand those changes, that's important. But that's over here. That's Medicare. Okay. okay? okay right. And right now they're going through their annual enrollment period. Separate from that, 
we here in Oregon have our state-based exchange, which we called Cover Oregon. Cover so I'm Oregon. sure everybody out there. Exchange. What, is, what does that mean? Exchange, exchange right? is a marketplace. A it's marketplace. where you're going to go and look for health insurance okay. to purchase. And Oregon has that. Exchange. Oregon, you know, not about 17 states created their own state-based exchange. Okay. That was Oregon part of the affordable. Of yeah, absolutely. That's Talk part of the it. Affordable Care Act. We call ours Cover Oregon. So there have been a ton of commercials on TV. You probably have seen the Cover Oregon ads some different songs and things like that, trying to get people to understand what the name of that is and, and drive them to the website. Um, so that is specific for people looking for individual health insurance or for small employers looking to put in health insurance. Um, I do always want to Just clarify, those groups. Just those groups. Just those groups. What it's percentage? not large group. It's not Medicare. It's just, just that group. individuals and small groups. Okay. But understand, even though we have an exchange called Cover Oregon, that's one way to purchase health insurance. Mm -hmm. You can still purchase it on what we call the direct market. So again, you can call up a carrier, you can go through an agent, you can buy plans on the direct market, or you can go through the exchange, Cover Oregon, and you can buy plans. The biggest reason, the biggest benefit for you to go through the exchange is if you think you're gonna qualify for a tax credit. That was one of the biggest pieces of the Affordable Care Act, is the idea of we're gonna to try to make health insurance more affordable. So there are these tax credits that will help some people pay for their premiums. So what we targeted is- Should they be working or not working? Or doesn't work matter, okay. it's your income. So what we targeted, so here in Oregon, uh, part of the Affordable Care Act said, look, if you're gonna have an exchange, state-based exchange, first of all, the government wanted you to raise your poverty level for Medicaid eligibility to 138% of the poverty mark. So somebody who's at 138% of the poverty mark- What's the poverty mark? That's a poverty not mark for an mean? individual is 11,500. So if 138% of it is uh, 15,856, that's the number. So if you're at or below that as an individual. That's annual, right? That's annual. You're gonna be on Medicaid. You're not gonna pay for your services. Um, you will have some direction as to where to go for care, but you're not gonna pay for services. You're not gonna pay for insurance. So that's everybody up to that threshold. Now, from 139% of the poverty mark up to 400% of the poverty mark, those people, based upon their income, may be eligible for a tax credit mm -hmm. that's going to help them pay their insurance. To give some perspective to that, an individual could make up to almost $46,000 per year and still potentially qualify for a tax credit. Wow. Right. So, again, <clears throat> the idea was let's help people purchase this insurance. I think, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, I think we went a little too far. I think, I think going so, up yeah. to 400% of the poverty mark, that's, that's a big group of people that we're going to be giving tax credits to. And remember, when we spend money at the federal level, that's our money. But let's say that you went out and bought the, an insurance plan, and, and what the government's going to try and do is help you buy kind of the middle of the road. So you've heard these different plans being talked about. So some people have heard um, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze level plans. Okay, so we're going to have these metallic levels of plans, and that will delineate the type of coverage. So the government's really trying to help you buy a silver plan. That's the middle of the road, hmm. okay? So not too much exposure, but it's also, you know, it's got us a little bit of a deductible to worry about. So depending on what the least expensive silver plan is in your area, which is unique because Portland has different insurance premiums than La Grande or down in Coos Bay. It's all based upon where you live, right? So in your area, whoever has the least expensive silver plan, the government's going to assist you in buying that plan. Hmm. So just as an example, let's say that based upon your income, that the least expensive silver plan, so your age, the least expensive silver plan was $300. I'm just going to throw that out there. But according to the government's chart and where you fall on the poverty level, they only want you to come out of pocket as a maximum of $250. They have a, a, a percentage of your gross income they want you to pay. So they say, well, we only want you to pay up to $250, but this silver plan, the least expensive silver plan in the market, costs $300. So now the federal government's actually going to give $50 to the insurance carrier on your behalf. Every month. So now it's 250. Now it's 250 for you. Absolutely. Hmm. So that will differ for everybody. It's going to base, be based upon your age because age will still drive the cost of the insurance. And then where do you fall on that line from 139% up to 400% of the poverty mark? Now, here's an interesting twist. Let's say that you're a young person and the lowest price silver plan in the market. Uh, let's say you're 21 years old, and the lowest price silver plan in the market is $173. Mm -hmm. But you're at, let's say, 300% of the poverty mark. Well, the government already wants you to pay at least 272% of your, excuse me, $272 a month towards your income. There's a percentage in there. That's about 9% of your gross income. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's what they want you to pay up to. The least expensive silver plan was only 173. You don't hmm. get a tax credit hmm. because the premium is actually less than the maximum that the government wanted you to have to pay for. Hmm. So some people will be helped, some people won't. It's going to depend on your age, the cost of the premium, where you fall in the poverty charts. All of that will be a factor. Well, now tell me something. Uh, now as I listen to what you're saying, and I'm sitting up there looking at what and listening to what we're talking to right now. Uh, the question becomes, well, where do I fit on the plan? I mean, where am I? Silver, gold, or whatever? It's whatever you want. I mean, so you, 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 get want. To, you get a choice of picking which plan. The government's going to assist you in picking the lowest cost silver plan. Right. So if you want the gold or a platinum plan, you're going to have to pay more money out of your own pocket to achieve that. Exactly. But if you want to go down to the bronze plan, which costs less, you can use the government's tax credit to buy okay. the lesser Okay. You know, the lesser coverage. It's up to you. But that's based on, uh, still based on dollars in terms of what you are on an annual basis aspect. Absolutely. Right? And you'll be, and you'll recertify every year. The only way to achieve getting that tax credit to assist you with your right. insurance premiums is through Cover Oregon, which is our state-based exchange. That is the main crux of what Cover Oregon is there to do. So as you enter the portal of Cover Oregon, which right now is not officially working like they had hoped it would be, they're, they're thinking sometime in early November, um, but when you enter the portal when it's when, portal when it's working, what will happen is you'll actually put in how many people are in your family. Is it one? Is it four? And for every single person in the family, they're going to ask, what do you estimate your income to be next year? That's payroll, gross payroll. That's your net income from self-employed business. That's Social Security benefits. That's unemployment, alimony, interest, uh, investment income, capital gains, dividend interest, St uh, student income, all of it is going to be looked at. And so who's responsible estimate. for notifying businesses and those individuals within those plans? Notifying? Uh, notifying the individual, the small business, from the standpoint of uh, the, the monies that they make and things of that nature. That's something you're going to have to ask, your, you know, you have to ask yourself. You're, you're the consumer. So you need, if, you, if you're yeah, not but sure, but look but at your last year tax return. But if the IRS are the one, they're basically picking up the monies, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do they send us a letter out and say, well, hey, this, this is where you fit? No. And this is who you call. You're going you're gonna to go into the portal and you're going to put in information about yourself, your family, and how much income is coming in that you estimate for next year. Oh, yes, and when indeed. you're done estimating for 2014, it's going to then tell you, first of all, do you qualify? Are you below 400% of the poverty mark? So they're going to first look to see if you qualify for Medicaid. Or if not, are you in between that range of 139 to 400% 40, of the poverty mark? If you are, what level of subsidy would you be eligible for? If you're over 400% of the poverty mark, they're going to tell you that you get to pay full price. I'm just trying to figure out who vets this kind of stuff. I mean, I, let's say, for instance, I'm making 60000 but, you know, I said, well, gee whiz, I don't want to be going in this particular bracket. I only made $20,000 this year. Oh, if you, if you, so what you're saying is <laughs> you really make 60000 yeah. but you're going to say you only make twenty. Yeah. Well, well I, that's what, one of the reasons that? that the portal's not working yet. So Cover Oregon is not fully functional yet because one of the biggest pieces, when you go to put in your information about your family and your income, they're going to ping, if it was working, the IRS. They're going to look at your last year's tax return. If it's more than 10% differential from what you made, like let's say you made sixty, but you're saying now you're going to make twenty, they they're going to go, whoa, whoa. They're going to keep processing you, but you're going to have 90 days to prove why. So over ten percent, that's when it pings. That's when it pings. So the idea is keep it under ten. <laughs> yes, there you go. I just gave everybody the secret. <laughs> that's the whole idea, folks. Yeah. So it's going to ping IRS. <laughs> they're they're actually using, I believe, uh, Equifax or something like that, because there's going to be some questions that come back to verify that you are who you are, and then also they're going to look, uh, they're going to ping CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, mm -hmm. to see if you're Medicaid eligible already or Medicare, and then they're also going to ping the Immigration Department to see if you are a U.S. citizen or, or legal mm -hmm. uh, visitor. So all those will be looked at, which is why the portal is not open right now. Mm -hmm. That My understanding is that was one of the pieces that they couldn't quite get up and running yet. So they're, they're targeting, I think, the last I heard, early November. Um, you can go on to Cover Oregon right now and fill out an application, but it's going to be handled manually. So we're not sure how long that's taking. Um, again, understand, you have two different ways to shop for insurance. You can go directly to the market or you can go through Cover Oregon. I'm telling my clients, Unless we're pretty confident that you're going to get some form of assistance, I'm not necessarily advising going through Cover Oregon because it's going to take about 45 minutes to an hour, they're estimating, to go through the application process just to see if you get a subsidy and how much, and then you pick a plan. So if we know you're not going to get a subsidy, seems like kind of a counterintuitive thing to go through all that. We'll just go direct. You know, that's a long time, Lisa, Isn't for it? just an average person. <laughs> 
just to sit down, <laughs> stand in front of a computer for 45 minutes. Well, it's a 21 page application. Gee whiz, I can barely go through two or three pages. I know. Nobody likes applications. That's why I'm I mean, so popular. I do all wow. the application stuff Jesus for people. Jesus Christ. But the, even then, I mean, calling someone and being able to sit down with that person to go through 45 pages. 21 pages. Or 21 yeah. pages. And you're asking those kinds of questions from the standpoint it's going to be taking some monies out of my budget that I have to live on. Mm -hmm. Right? Fair? Yeah. And I got to go back down. I got my rent payment. I got all kinds of goodies and whatever. And all of a sudden, what do I do? So I, I, the point I'm trying to make is that it looked like to me that was not enough effort spending and talking about the benefits, if you will, yeah, of something that would benefit your health situation as opposed to coming after the fact, asking you for some monies, which you haven't told me anything about how it's going to benefit me. Right. Some so, people say, well, I'm not going to even carry anything. The heck with it. Absolutely. There are some people who are going to try and do that. And, you know, we have that now. The, you know, the estimates out there say that about, there's about 15, 18 percent of the nation uninsured. That's I, I always hear that number. And so that was what they were driving after. How can we insure everybody? That was the driving factor of this, which is why we have the mandate that ensures that you buy insurance or you face a penalty or a tax. But the reality is, uh, even now, I've read articles, uh, even the Kaiser Foundation, they're estimating that we're still going to end up with about 15% of the people uninsured. And the but reason it, for that is they're still going to find themselves not able to afford their portion. They might not believe in insurance. Right. They might say, I'm going to wait. Now that I don't have to worry about any kind of underwriting or pre-existing, I'll just wait and buy it when I need it. Right? Sounds right, pretty smart. Right, right. I do want to give a little bit of a caution. Uh, right now, this is our very first open enrollment for the, in, for the entire nation. It right. started October 1. Right. Right. It technically closes March 31st. That is for the individuals. If you mm -hmm. get group insurance through your employer, that's already being handled. Mm -hmm. don't, that doesn't change right. your such. Right. So if you're an individual, you have from October 1st through the end of, de, of March to get a insurance plan in place to avoid paying that mandate. Hmm. The window will close. And there will not be the ability for you to go out and purchase an individual health plan for the rest of the year unless you have a life-changing event. So uh, um, a birth, a marriage, death, uh, um, what a, you moved, uh, you, become, you lose your employment, you, you, you become Medicaid status. There'll be some life-changing events. But other than that, if, you're just, if everything's status quo for you and you didn't buy when you could have and now you want it because now you've got a diagnosis, you will not be able to buy insurance. So that window will close. It won't open again until October 15th through December 7th mm -hmm. of 2014. It will be the exact same window that our Medicare beneficiaries deal with now to decide, do I have insurance? And I, no, I want to add it. Or do I want to change the insurance plan I have? Whatever you're going to do will need to be done in that seven weeks, both now going forward for Medicare and the individual population. When that window closes, it's closed for a whole other year. Mm -hmm. So you have one window every year to buy health insurance. So if you think you're going to go without and buy it when you when you get a diagnosis, that may not really work out for you. You know, as I, as I listen to this, I, I'm also thinking about the uh, the fact that you say about 20% of the population are just not, they don't, they don't have any insurance, whatever. But at the same time, they do get the care. They can just walk into any facility and say, I'm right. sick, right? That's part of our problem as a country, though, is right. that our ERs are being flooded with people right. that might necessarily be uh, having an emergency. Again, that's the rationale of saying we should have spent more time talking <clears> to you. <throat> How do you get those folks in the system? In fact, there's another group of folks that, that's out there and getting free medical care and home care and housing and food and the whole nine years. All you have to do is just commit a crime, just go to the local Safeway and yeah, steal yeah. a loaf of bread. Right. Get into the criminal justice system, you get it all free. I mean, how are we going to get those people to pick pick up their fair share? <laughs> that's a whole other show. Well, we, got, <laughs> we, we got a lot of folks in that criminal justice system, you know what I mean? And, and all, what I'm saying is that I spend a little time talking to folks just on the street, the homeless mm -hmm. and folks like that. Yeah. And, and, you know, they say, hey, you know, hey, we don't have to worry about anything. But the point is that, you know, with this, this driving force in this whole issue, not spending enough time in it, those folks who are getting down to the point and saying, hey, I, I just can't make, I, really, I can't make a house payment. Mm -hmm. I don't know where to go, so I'm just not going to make the house payment. Or if not that, I'm not going to go to the hospital because this. But if I understand what the system is, all I do is just go down to the local grocery store and steal a loaf of bread. I can get health care, get my dental done, and, all yeah. that, and they'll keep me there for about a month. And then I go back, and I'm fine. Right. We, we yes, definitely saying, have, I, I we're think... We're not spending enough time on that end. Absolutely. I think as a country, and, and one of my biggest critiques of the law in whole yeah. is that we didn't spend enough time saying what is the pervasive problem. Right. Okay. The pervasive okay. problem is how do we get people to account for themselves? 
And that could take different forms. So maybe it's changing how you eat or whether you smoke or not or whatever the case may be. Maybe it's your stress level. But how do we change the idea of mm -hmm. when I'm sick, I'm going to run to the ER? That's Who wants to be at the yeah. ER, right? Um, understanding what programs are out there, how do you access mm -hmm. it? So changing the curve of people that are overusing the system, mm -hmm. right? We have a lot of fraud that happens. We have yeah. a lot of abuse of the system. How do we curve that while also encouraging people that really need to be there, mm -hmm. need to be getting services, making sure that they're going in on a consistent basis? Um, so, so there are some, some pieces of that within the law, but I don't think not enough. Mm -hmm. like, I don't think we focused on... How do we curve the cost factors? The cost factors of health care. So when we look at why we had this law, one of the biggest reasons was people can't afford insurance or some people can't afford insurance. So how do we, the insurance premium is driven by the cost of health care. The reality is an insurance carrier is nothing more than a payer of the bills. It's a business. So you come to them and say, look, I don't know if I'm going to have health issues in the future, but if I do, I certainly don't have $50,000, $100,000 right, right, sitting in my right, bank account. Right. Most of us don't, right? right. I, know, I know I don't. But you're the insurance company. So what if I just pay you a set dollar amount every month, and then if there's a spike in my health care costs, you're going to handle that for me. Okay, that's a business arrangement. So if the cost of health care that the insurance carrier has to pay for keeps going up, mm -hmm. the actual cost from the doctors, from the hospitals, from all these services, as that trends up, the premiums have to trend up with it. Mm -hmm. They have to charge premiums to support those claims. And here in Oregon... For the last 10 years, our carriers in the individual market have averaged 90 cents of every dollar collected in premiums paid back out in claims. You can find that on the in Oregon Insurance Division's website right now. They do a report every year. It's fascinating to look at it because people have this assumption. Cents of an hour. Yeah, people have an assumption that that somehow these these insurance carriers have huge profit margins. The reality is they probably average about a one, maybe two percent profit margin, and that's a good year. And if you look at all of our insurance carriers. We've got a couple that are for profit. We've got some that are um, uh, non-profit and some not for profit. So it, it, it isn't what people assume it could be. And so you know, how do we curve those costs? Well, some of the driver fa driving factors of cost are overuse, uh, overuse of prescription medications. Medications make up, I think, 25% of our national you know, gross, gross um, you know, of what we're spending in our healthcare dollars, 25% just in prescriptions, hmm. which is crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. That's crazy. Um, and then when the ER, which is huge. ER, absolutely. So so use that could have been avoided, costs that could have been avoided. Then you also have um, Medicare and Medicaid. So we have two government programs right now. Medicare is for people who are age 65 or older or disability before age 65. And then you've got Medicaid. So people that are definitely in poverty level getting assistance from the state and feds for their health care. The problem there is those are two government programs, and the only way that they've been able to survive so far is that the government sets the payment rate for that doctor in that hospital. Hmm. So on average, here in Oregon, because Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates aren't the same nationwide. Some states fare better than others. Oregon, unfortunately, is at the lowest reimbursement rate nationwide. Part of the reason is we've done such a great job of managing our Medicare beneficiaries, but we're paid the least amount. So a doctor, on average... Maybe he bills $300 for a visit. On average, he's going to get about 30 to 35% of that bill. So about $100. Now, he's a business person. Whether we want to admit it or not, he went to school, he has a practice, it's a business for him. When he loses that $200 because he was treating a Medicare patient, mm -hmm. do you think he walks away from it? Or do you think he has to figure out how to inflate his rates over here hmm. for the private market? For the, yeah, for the private market, right? So one of the biggest driving factors of some of our health care costs are the underpayment or under reimbursement to our doctors and hospitals. And doctors treating. have to carry Medicare. They don't have to. They don't have they to. They don't care. have to. So you've got doctors um, all across the nation. Here in, in Oregon, you'll see it more evasive in the outlying areas that will simply say, we don't take Medicare. So what do those folks do? Well, you got to find a doctor who will take Medicare. I'll walk, we'll in, take ER. Medicaid. I'll walk in the ER. Exactly. Right? Now, we, you know, again, there are doctors that take Medicare, but what I find when I'm helping my clients, we call their doctor's offices and make sure what insurance will you take. Um, if a doctor's not taking new, they, 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 a lot of times what they'll do is they'll take who they have. So if you're a client with a doctor, as you age into Medicare, they'll usually keep you. But if you're brand new to them, mm -hmm. never been with them before and you're on Medicare, most doctors probably right now aren't taking new clients for Medicare. I have had clients that have had doctors for 30, 35 years. And as soon as they turn to Medicare, doctor said, I'm sorry, I don't take Medicare anymore. Same thing with Medicaid. So we, we you know, if you're going to put 
out a national program, a government program to assist our senior citizens who've been paying into the system their entire working well, that's life. That's the problem. That's or the to assist people in low income levels mm -hmm. that need our help. Please understand, you got to put out a, a system that's actually going to work for them. How frustrating can it be in either situation that you're 65 or older and you've retired, you've paid into the system, and now you go to find a doctor and you can't, or it's a struggle to find a doctor? Or on the other side, you are needing assistance. You are at poverty level and you need that assistance, and it's hard for you to find a doctor who will take Medicaid. Wow. So, did we, you know, you got to solve the problem. It's not just throwing the program out there. Does, is the program working for the people that it was intended to? Well, Lisa, this has been interesting, but to the point, I think I've absorbed about 20%. I need you to right? come back. <laughs> You've got to come back. Lisa. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's really a lot. And we didn't even lot. talk about how the plans no, are designed but, No, but i tell you what we're going to do. If you don't mind, can you come back next week? I'll, I'll so we yes. continue with, I think possible? I have to move the pumpkin carving time around for my family, well, but I'll make it right. work. Bring them over here. We'll, right, we'll, we'll just do, do a big pumpkin carving, carving right contest. Here Why not? <laughs> Halloween theme. But no, we really need, in all seriousness, no, the, the, I think they, they really need, we need more time with you, if it's okay with you. Absolutely. But it's been enjoyable. It's been very informative, and we really appreciate it, Lisa. Thank you. This Thanks for having great. me. And thank you as a business person. I really appreciate you coming on. Most people won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, you've heard it. And you've heard Lisa, and uh, and you've heard the information. Again, get together with your friends and whatever, and maybe you can call us in next time around when she's here. So bring out those, take out all those plans that you've already signed up for, and, and we'll sit there and we'll talk a little bit more about Lisa. Again, have a good evening. I'll talk to you later. Thanks again. Lisa.